Edmund Kemper III was born in Burbank, California on December the 18th, 1948, the middle child of Clarnell Kemper and Edmund Kemper II. His father was a World War II veteran who, after the war, tested nuclear weapons before returning to California as an electrician. Unfortunately, there were troubles in the marriage as Clarnell called her husband's job menial, while he said that suicide missions and atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with his wife. I had uh, an upbringing that was, uh, some have called, uh, dysfunctional, okay? Parents divorced when I was young. My mother started drinking heavily. Uh, she was working to raise three kids. We were not being cooperative about it. She drank more. She punished us harder, uh, probably out of desperation. Uh, so s character sets were being developed at that point. Rather than me going to Boy Scouts and getting achievement badges, I was not going to Boy Scouts and not getting achievement badges. I was finding devious ways to get around the rules of the home because the whole home life just, I watched it deteriorate from what typical kids on the block were doing to coming home from school that I didn't like anyway. And ironically, I have a high IQ. I didn't know that till I was locked up the first time for murder. I always thought I was a little missing up here, a little short, uh, because I was always called stupid, I was called slow, don't you think when you do things. That was the problem. I wasn't thinking when I did things. I just did by rote, I did by memory, I did by example. And I had absolutely no faith in myself at all. I had no interaction going on in my own mind. I was not a thinker. I was not an individual. So I had a mother. I had a father. Father worked. He brought in a big paycheck. We had a nice house. We had friends. We went to school, right? We had birthdays. We had Christmas. We had vacations. Huh? He had Saturday night with the poker buddies out in the, in the guest house by the garage. We were living pretty good. And uh, she absolutely hated that. This, this stereotypical response of this deadhead, this muttonhead she's married to, of wanting to go out and play cards in a smoke-filled room, drinking beer and with these old war buddies. Edmund Kemper III was born 13 pounds, and by the age of four, he was already a lot taller than others his age. But as a child, he quickly began to show signs of antisocial behavior. One of my favorite tricks back then was to go out and lay in front of the, in the cars, in the traffic. I'm um, walking down the sidewalk with a friend, you know, a roustabout friend. And we're clowning around about something, and I'll say, hey, check this out, and I'll go lay in the street. Like a stiff, I go, I'll lay in the street like I got run over. And a car comes driving by, and of course I'm expecting this guy isn't drunk. I'm expecting this guy isn't slightly demented and say, hey, there's a kid laying in front of me. Yeah, it's his fault. Boom, boom, you know, and just shift gears going over me. They always stop, and they get jump out of the car and get all upset when I get up and walk off or run away. And, uh, but it was a little game we played. He didn't go lay in front of the car, so I was doing that. It indicated, I think, uh, how little I thought of myself. I think it indicated that a part of me would rather I got run over right then than uh, I pursue what I was continuing to pursue in my life because, you know, looking at myself and how I was developing inside, nothing good could come of that. By 10 years old, he buried a cat alive, and once it was dead, he dug it back up, cut its head off, and mounted it on a spike. He gained satisfaction from lying to his family about this incident, and once he turned 13, they had another pet cat who favoured his younger sister, Alan, leading to him murdering it and keeping pieces of the animal in his closet, until his mother did find them, but nothing more was done about the discovery. Edmund had a sick and twisted psyche, performing rituals with his sister's dolls, even removing their heads and hands. I had a cap gun. It was uh, by Mattel, right? Fanner 50, it was a very fancy cap gun. I got it in New York City. I went there for one summer with a cousin. And when I came back, my sister was kind of jealous, my little sister. She hated that cap gun because it came between us as brother and sister. It was something I had that she didn't have. Uh, that trip represented something she really wanted I, and she didn't get, and I did. Uh, but very soon after getting back from that trip, she got in an argument with me. It was over something really petty. She got really outraged. She picked up that cap pistol. I said, don't throw that. And she threw it right at me, wham, hard. 
It hit the floor and my toe, and it hurt bad. Uh, but it broke the gun, the inner mechanism. It wouldn't work after that. I picked it up. I found that out. It wouldn't cock it and pull the trigger anymore. And that really outraged me. So I said, so you want to play like that, huh? So I go running into her room. She says, what are you doing? What are you doing? She's shrieking and chasing me, right? So I run into her room, and I grab up her Barbie doll. It was the one fancy doll she had, the Barbie doll. Everybody has one, right? Uh, she had a pair of sewing scissors sitting there and a sewing machine, a sewing kit. I grabbed the scissors out. The head didn't decapitate, it pops off. So I popped that off. I said, well, that's going to go right back on. That's no damage. So I took the scissors and I cut the hands off the doll. I said, here, now you got a toy that doesn't work too good. I got a toy that doesn't work too good. It's not me to judge these professionals. But when they look at me here on Monday morning after the football game and they say, gee, here's all these little parts of the puzzle, oh, this indicates what he was going to do. And if that's the case, I want to know about the teenage kid or the preteen kids and the puberty, the pre and post puberty kids. They're going through these raging moods and attitudes that go out and kill neighborhood cats. They hang them up from a telephone pole or hang them up from a tree, shoot them full of arrows and set fire to them. I was reading about that in Dear Abby. Where are those children today? Are they serial killers? Or are they police chiefs and mayors and, and aldermen and assemblymen? To a point I agree with them, that someone who's acting out and has a dysfunctional childhood, or has just gone through a dysfunctional childhood and hasn't gotten violent yet, or is heading toward that direction, passive aggressive. Violence was the last thing I exhibited, and then it was murderous violence. At one point, his older sister Susan mocked him and asked him why he didn't try to kiss a teacher of his that she knew he had a crush on. Edmund replied, if I kiss her, I'd have to kill her first. The deep dark secrets that one sibling shares with another. It's troubling inside of me, so uh, that was from that, that period, that more advanced period where people were still there, they just weren't animate. They could not react or respond to what I was feeling or what I was sharing because what I was sharing was very embarrassing, very humiliating. It's hard to talk about now, really, because it's uh, obviously it affects uh, how a person feels about himself. But it's not too hard to get around that because then I look at the wreckage I have behind me, the dead people. At a young age, he snuck out of the house, armed with his father's bayonet, and actually visited his teacher's home, where he watched her through the windows, but no further incident took place. He would play twisted games as a child called gas chamber or electric chair. He would ask Alan to tie him up and to flip an imaginary switch, while he would then tumble and writhe all over the floor, pretending that he was being executed. And we had this big old overstuffed chair up in my room. And we'd, we'd uh, it was not just my sister and I, it was my sister and I and a friend, a close friend. We got into all these games. We got into one game where we'd roll up in a rug, and a person who would try to get out of it is just like a large throw rug. And it was, uh, I guess, what fascinated us individually about it is it was a completely, uh, it broke up the monotony. I guess of what we were doing. Didn't have a lot of toys to play with. Uh, we got bored with those pretty quickly. So we looked for things to do. You roll up in the rug and, and you try to get out and the other two would leave the room and we see who could get out fastest. You know, you try to work your way out sideways or scoot out the end of it or whatever. And uh, it went from that to being tied in this overstuffed chair with a cord or something or, or pieces of sheet or sash or something. And uh, went through this process. I guess we're, that's back when, in 1960 when uh, Carol Chessman was executed down in California. We're up in Montana. And so I got, uh, there's a lot of media coverage on that because he was an author. He'd written books. They're trying to save his life. He'd not killed anybody. Why are they executing him? And um, so that's, I think, where the fascination with that came in, that gas chamber effect. Things didn't get better as he was often teased by his sisters. At one point, Susan tried to push him in front of a train, and on another occasion, she shoved him into the deep end of a swimming pool where he nearly drowned to death. His sisters always teased him, and so did his mother, showing preferential treatment towards her daughters. And when I sniveled about it, when I complained and I cried about it, I got smacked in the head. You know, what's the matter with you? Quit being such a wimp. I got it in the legs. One time I turned around shrieking and she hit me in the mouth 
and the little keeper on the clasp flew off, little silver buckle thing. And she smacked me, this thing breaks off on my mouth, right? And she hits me across the face with this belt and says, shut up, the neighbors are gonna think I'm beating you. But I'm looking at her, what, you know? Uh, I'm not supposed to cry out, which is a natural reaction to these great red welts that are going on me. I sure I was a little shit. I got rude downstairs. She took me upstairs and beat the hell out of me. But Edmund was always close with his father. But sadly, in 1957, when he was just nine years old, his parents separated, which truly devastated him. And I go stay with my dad. And he, I, I can only say he reflected back on his childhood and said, gee, I wish I'd been treated this way. So that's how he treated me and my stepbrother. And we responded to that. We'd go, if we needed spending money, we would go out and we'd do tasks around the neighborhood, clean yards, rake this, mow that, water the flowers, and make a few dollars, and we'd have some fun. Okay, and then um, sometimes he'd ask us to do something. We'd do it because he was always fair with us and kind and he was generous with us. So 30, 30 days of doing this opened up whole new feelings in me that I'd never had before. And I wish I'd had more experience with my father growing up so I could orient more to being tall around not tall peers. He was raised by his mother in Helena, Montana, but she was a neurotic alcoholic who often abused him. She would believe that he would harm his sisters, so she forced him to sleep in a locked basement. It was a walk-in basement, but it was in Montana. It was a full basement, it had granite walls, uh, hewn wood floorboards, and it looked like some old dungeon out of a castle or something. I was eight years old, seven and a half, eight years old, and then I was very susceptible. My imagination was very livid. And there was an old furnace in the basement that had been converted from uh, burning coal to burning, and coal and wood to burning gas. And that was, it had a central heating system with uh, uh, your typical radiators. And if you've ever lived in a home like that, you know, you the binging, the clang, the pop, the, the rattles, the weird sounds in the night that can be spooky to a kid. Well, at a certain time of the evening, the family left the center room, the, the living room of the house. My mother and my sisters, or my sisters themselves, would go up to bed upstairs, where I used to go to bed, upstairs. I had to go down to the basement. And an eight-year-old child had a tough time differentiating the reason in that. Why am I going to the basement? I'm going to hell, they're going to heaven. Uh, Earth is the living room. I'm going down to deal with demons and monsters and ghosts and all the things that scare me. They don't have to. I was there about six months in that room, and I developed some very, very uh, particular and articulate um, rituals that I felt I had to go through to protect myself. I was, again, it's embarrassing. I was a youngster, and if you can imagine me going down a staircase of rough hewn wood, there's no guardrail. So one step wrong and you're off into this black pit. I turn on the light, it's a little circular light switch, and a single naked bulb goes on down at the bottom of these stairs, okay? So I turn that light on, I open the door, I close the door, because my mother complains of the cold coming in from the basement. I go down the stairs, I get to the bottom, I do a 180 degree turn, and I walk the full length of the house on this floor with these pipes rattling and wheezing and banging over my head, it's pitch black ahead of me, and the only light is behind me hanging down from the ceiling. I'm now cut off from the house, cut off from them. I walk this full length into the darkness from this gradients of light into complete darkness, groping around in the dark. I, I do about a 45 degree angle when I get to the end. And I pull the string and it lights up this end. And then I'm supposed to walk all the way back to the other end, turn that light off, and now walk toward the light from the dark and I've got this horrible terror going on inside of me. And this is every night, this is every day, because it's pitch black down there, no windows. And she would also mock him for his looks. By the time he was 15 years old, Edmund stood at six foot four. She would refuse to show any affection towards her son as she believed that it would turn him gay. She claimed that he reminded her of his father and that no woman would ever love him. I would like to think it was a better part of my character that was resisting this kind of pressure to fit into some mold that she had the image of as being the good little kid. I'll be damned if I'm going to be that good little kid. I'm getting the hell beat out of me for not being that little kid. 
I got, re I, I got, uh, I don't know what you call it, resistant to it. But again, it's not in manly ways or in prideful ways. It was sneaky, little devious ways. I'd get around that. And one of the ways was she won't give me an allowance. I'll take money out of her purse. I never robbed her, took all of it. I'd take a dime here, a quarter there, 15 cents there, 50 cents here. She comes in drunk at night. I she's not going to know how much change she has. So to, re to rebound on that, she started counting her money at all kinds of odd times to keep on top of me. And she, it was like a game we played for years. It's believed that Clarnell Kemper suffered from borderline personality disorder, but Edmund believed that she was just a sick and angry woman who needed help. She'd beat me halfway senseless with that belt, trying to impress, and, and in terror tactics. Okay, we're going to eat dinner and I'm going to beat your ass afterwards, you know, so I could think about it for a half hour. Or after some little thing she's doing. And she tried psychological tactics. She tried, uh, I'm going to put you in an orphanage. I'm going to disavow you. And none of that shit worked. But due to the treatment from his sisters and mother, Edmund grew up with a strong disdain for all women. There's a house with three women and one male, one boy, me. And uh, I got a little defensive. I'm saying, gee, this is kind of ganging up. My mother was there. She was there to beat me. She was there to humiliate me. She was there to use me as an example of how inferior men are. When he was just 14, Edmund ran away from home and headed to California in order to try to find his father. Unfortunately, in doing so, he discovered that his dad had not only remarried, but now had a new stepson. When I was 14 years old, I ran away from my mother. They mentioned that. But if you look at it in the overall picture, why did I run away? I wanted to be with my father. That's a very topical uh, approach to it. I wanted to get away from my mother because I was dreaming, thinking, fantasizing murder all day long. I couldn't get it out of my head. She and I, I couldn't battle with her because I was very intimidated by her. She's six feet tall, she weighs two and a quarter, 225 pounds, she's not a fat woman. She's just this great big woman who I was terrified of. She had uh, verbal capabilities you wouldn't believe. I used to watch her field strip grown men in emotional uh, little contests. And when they get to a point where they wanted to smack her, then she started attacking them on beating women. Oh, slap the woman around, you know. And then she'd toy with them on that. And I'd watch these guys dance around the room having fits, knocking out windows, punch a hole in the door, and stomp off. And she could control people like that. I'm sitting there watching that in awe from the one point of view and in terror from the other. I grew up with this stuff. She did that to my dad when they were always battling before the divorce. I started becoming fascinated with things evolving around death and destruction and evil and all of that. I'm not saying I became a Satan worshiper because I didn't. I was afraid of evil things, afraid of those powers uh, that we all don't understand. I was building up big loads of frustration inside, big loads of, uh, of hatred because I had no outlet for it. I should have developed outlets, but I didn't know how at that time. So the outlets that developed themselves, or I developed without knowing it, um, were fantasies about um, me being the last. I, I got that out of a school book, this thing of being the last person alive on the world. And, and the, the thing that was posed to me in this textbook was, it was uh, social studies. And it was meant to play upon the loneliness youngsters can feel. And that it's a very uncomfortable feeling. And you can't have love and you can't have adventure and you can't have excitement without being able to share it with other people because that's where a lot of the dimension comes from. Okay, so they pose this thing at me. Well, what if you were the last person in the world and you had all these cars and airplanes and boats and ships and, and things to do but nobody to share it with, right? Um, wouldn't that be awful? And I thought, hey, that's a thought. I never thought of that before. So it became a seed, like a little core to fantasies for me. And some mysterious thing has happened and everybody else is gone and I got all these things I can do and no inhibitions, no restrictions. I can do what I want. I don't get yelled at anymore. Okay, that soon became very hollow. So I built upon that and added to it. Well, people were still around, but they were inanimate. They couldn't affect me. They couldn't hurt me. Regardless, Edmund did live with his father for a while, but he made his new stepmother feel extremely uncomfortable. Edmund resented her for taking his father away from him. 
and would often stare at her blankly, even once walking in on her naked and admitted that this sexually aroused him. His behavior grew worse around his stepmother, leading to him being sent away to live with his paternal grandparents in North Fork, California, to hopefully straighten him out. We went up to the mountains to stay for Christmas, and I got left behind. I was having friction with my stepbrother and my stepmother. There was problems there. Uh, we were vying for his interests, vying for his love. They were desperate because they're the new family. I'm desperate because I've never had the man of my life. I wanted my father's love. I wanted his approval. I wanted his recognitions. And we all got very greedy and desperate at that time, so we fought each other a lot. And it was a lot of friction, and he couldn't handle that, so he got rid of me. His father felt like this was the best decision, but his ex-wife Clarnell tried to advise against it. He is a really funny bird, and you're taking a risk by leaving him with your parents. You may be surprised to wake up one morning to learn that they have been killed. But Edmund hated this experience. Did you feel like an outsider, an outcast always. early on? I always felt like an outsider, and it's again because I didn't ever fit in. I'd moved around a lot, for one thing. Uh, I went to different schools when I was in Los Angeles from age, you know, five till seven, when I'm going to uh, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Uh, I got in trouble in public school. And I look fondly back on those times because that's when I was acting out and I was normal. You know what I'm saying? I lived in complete isolation with my senile grandfather. My grandmother thought she had more balls than any man, and she was constantly emasculating my grandfather and me to prove it. I couldn't please her. It was like being in jail. I became a walking time bomb, and I finally blew. On August the 27th, 1964, Edmund was now 15 years old when he was sitting at the kitchen table with his grandmother, Maud Kemper, and an argument began. Edmund stormed off and grabbed a rifle that his grandfather had given him for hunting, though it had been confiscated as he started to shoot random animals with it. Kemper returned to the kitchen where he then shot his own grandmother in the head and twice more in the back. Some accounts do mention him also stabbing her with a knife, but this detail remains uncertain. Why did you feel you had to kill her? That was a, an outburst. It wasn't I had felt I had to. I was up there with them for 10 months. Uh, at first it was okay, because it was the calm of being away from Montana. There wasn't the, the hellia stuff. I was going to a good school. Uh, as the months went on, uh, the veneer went away. My grandmother had made agreements with me from the gate that she wouldn't get into little humiliating mind games with me like my mother and stepfather had done. Right? And I agreed I wouldn't do certain things. And then this mind game stuff started up. She decides she's going to raise me like she raised her three sons. And she's going to get rid of all this negative crap that my mother put on me. She's recognizing it as something my mother put on me. And I don't know that it wasn't. Some of it was. But a lot of it was my inability to deal with uh, complex, critical, psychological situations. I could not deal with them. So I resisted it. I ran away. That was my answer to run. I ran from the people in Montana. I ran from my mother in Montana. Uh, I, I let my father park me up there to get away from the strife in LA. Now I'm stuck. All the bridges, bridges are burned because my grandparents are there 24 hours a day. I can't run from them. She never let me get out of her sight for more than an hour without yelling my name out to see where I was. She was convinced I wanted to go down the mountain into town, a little North Fork to uh, hang around with kids, rowdies and stuff, and be a juvenile delinquent. So she would never let me go down there on my own. She never let me leave the property. And I just, it started simmering, I guess. It started building the, the, the passions and the tension. I started developing the fantasies toward her from my mother, killing her. Kemper's grandfather was out grocery shopping at the time. But once he returned, Edmund went outside and shot him right next to his own car. Unsure what to do next, he called his mother, who immediately told him to call the police. In doing so, Edmund actually became one of the only serial killers to ever turn himself in.
He claimed that he just wanted to know what it was like to kill someone and he only took out his grandfather as well so that he wouldn't have to live without his wife, as well as Edmund fearing his angry reaction to what he had done. While a lot of people can stereotype the type of uh, criminal that a serial killer would be, society has to loosen up its belt a bit and admit that jailers like at the uh, Tucker farm down in Arkansas who get tired of recalcitrant troublemaker inmates, take them out back and kill them and bury them, are serial killers. Different motive. Even adults, I mean, they talk uh, in various relationships how we have our darker side and there's things that you have thought, as an example, that you'd never want to share with anybody because they're so cruel or they're so unspeakably out of sync with what's going on that you would be too ashamed to share it with someone. Like, boy, I'd like to knock his head off, or I'd like to kill this guy, or she's such a bitch, you know. Um, we all do that. Um, I didn't know that. So I'm adding to the problem, the impetus of this negative orientation. I must be really evil little kid because I'm thinking all these horrible things. It's believed that these killings were Edmund's attempt to avenge the rejection he felt from both of his parents. But it was believed that these crimes were just incomprehensible for a 15-year-old boy to have committed. He was deemed a paranoid schizophrenic and sent to a maximum security facility for mentally ill convicts. However, now the diagnosis was questioned, as Edmund showed no flight of ideas, no interference with thought, no expression of delusions or hallucinations, and no evidence of bizarre thinking. He had a high IQ and seemed to be extremely intelligent. He was re-evaluated and concluded to have a passive-aggressive type with a personality trait disturbance. He showed himself to be a model prisoner and was even trained to administer psychiatric tests to other inmates. Little did they know, however, that they were actually feeding his sick mind. Edmund was secretly using these tests to learn how to manipulate his own psychiatrists. He was smart and charming enough to gain the staff's trust, enough for them to allow him to access their psychiatric assessment devices. And in doing so, he memorized all of the relevant responses and used this in order to rig his own test results, now claiming that he was completely rehabilitated. On December the 18th, 1969, Edmund was now 21 years old and he was released on parole. Psychiatrists advised against this, however, but they were ignored and he was given back to the care of his mother who had since remarried and then divorced again. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful. Uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren. Once released, Kemper claims that he actually tracked down his father and managed to meet up with him. They allegedly met at a restaurant for some drinks and to talk, where Kemper claims that his father actually forgave him for what he had done to his parents, though this would be the last time they would ever see one another. However, his father's stepson disputes this story and claimed that Edmund Sr. always blamed himself for putting his parents in danger. He claimed that he only forgave him once he was on his deathbed, passing away on January the 19th, 1985. On November the 29th, 1972, three years later, Edmund's criminal record was entirely erased. If I were to see this patient without having any history available or getting any history from him, I would think that we're dealing with a very well-adjusted young man who had initiative, intelligence, and who was free of any psychiatric illnesses. It is my opinion that he has made a very excellent response to the years of treatment and rehabilitation, and I would see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be of any danger to himself or to any member of society. And since it may allow him more freedom as an adult to develop his potential, I would consider it reasonable to have a permanent expunction of his juvenile records. You were able to appear like an ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. 
During his time with his mother, Edmund attended community college, one of the requirements of his parole. And he actually wanted to become a police officer, though he was rejected because of his size, now standing at six foot nine. Despite this rejection, he did remain friendly with the local police officers and became part of their inner circle of friends. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? He had a few dead-end jobs before working for the State of California Division of Highways, though this was when his relationship with his mother continued to get worse. They would argue on a frequent basis, to the point their neighbors would often overhear them. My mother and I started right in on horrendous battles. Just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. It would go to fists with a man. But this was my mother, and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her. But I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. Edmund managed to save up enough money to finally move out and get a place with a friend in Alameda, California. Despite this, his mother would pay surprise visits and constantly ring him up, causing further frustration as he felt he just couldn't escape her. During this time, Edmund was riding a motorcycle when he was actually hit by a car. His arm was injured and he did receive a $15,000 settlement against the driver. He used this money to buy himself his own car and one day during a drive, he noticed a group of young women hitchhiking. This gave him the idea to begin storing plastic bags, knives, blankets and handcuffs inside his car. He then began picking up young women before letting them go without any incident. He claimed to have picked up around 150 hitchhikers without any illegal activity before he finally began to feel homicidal and sexual urges that he was no longer able to control. And I'm picking up young women and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching where I could act out and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides, this fantastic passion. On May the 7th, 1972, Edmund was driving in Berkeley, California, when he saw two 18-year-old students hitchhiking, Mary Ann Pesci and Anita Mary Lucessa. He offered to take them to Stanford University. He drove for an hour before taking them to a secluded wooded area instead, near Alameda. He then handcuffed Pesci and locked Lucessa in the boot before stabbing and strangling Pesci to death, and then killing Lucessa the same way. Edmund did confess that while handcuffing Pesci, he accidentally brushed one of her breasts and felt so embarrassed that he even apologized despite murdering her moments later. It finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. It was going to happen. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. I just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell him. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. 
And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car. I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run, and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. I thought I was pretty slick and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't, because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way. He put both bodies in the back of his car before returning home. En route, he was actually pulled over by a police officer for having a broken tail light, but the corpses weren't discovered and he was let go without incident. Once home, Edmund's roommate wasn't there, so he took the bodies inside where he took photographs, had sex with the corpses, and then dismembered them. He then put the parts into plastic bags before abandoning them near Loma Prieta Mountain. Before getting rid of their disembodied heads, he made them perform oral sex on him. Pesci's skull was found three months later, but the rest of her body was never discovered, nor were any of Lucessa's remains. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you cut them off, and why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Um, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens, and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. Possessing the severed heads of women. Men didn't turn me on. That wasn't very, I couldn't appreciate the appearances of a guy. I see movies as a youth, and I'm, you know, I'm seeing, uh, this was a, not common, but it was a frequent feature in some movies where they use a shock effect. They'll have someone get their head cut off, or there's a head sitting there when they come around the corner or open the drawer or something. And it went from, that got caught up in my morbid fascination. I made a comment and someone wrote about it that, um, that when I was young, I was about eight or nine years old, I went to a, this little come on, it was like at a record store or something, and they had this crowd of kids there and there was a magic show. And this guy, you've probably seen it, the fake guillotine, hand pressed, and they put the potato there and someone puts their neck in the, uh, in the brace and they slam this thing down and the potato down below chops in two but the person's head doesn't fall off, right? And everybody gets very fascinated by that. Oh my God, and then when he puts the blade in place and he pushes it down, it goes through that neck hole, but it never chops anybody's head off. Okay, so he wanted a volunteer out of the, I'm not standing in this crowd watching this show, and he wanted a volunteer out of the audience, and some quite beautiful little 16-year-old girl gets up there and this big laugh and you know, all giddy and stuff, and I start getting caught up in this. I said, wow, but the concept of it, was so raw and it was titillating. I says, wow, gee, I gotta watch this. On September the 14th, 1972, Edmund picked up 15-year-old dance student Aiko Ku, who was hitchhiking after missing her bus. Kemper used to pretend that he was running late in order to convince these women to get in his car, leading them to believe that he was in such a rush that he just wouldn't have time to do anything wrong. He drove her to an isolated area before pulling a gun out, but he somehow accidentally locked himself out of his own car. Regardless, Ku, for some reason, let him back inside, despite the fact that the gun was in there with her. 
One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. Kemper proceeded to choke her into unconsciousness before raping and murdering the woman. He then stashed the body in the back of his car again before going to a bar for some drinks. He then admired the corpse before returning home. There, he had sex with the body before dismembering it and disposing it as before. Ku's mother alerted the police of her disappearance and put up hundreds of flyers asking for information, but received absolutely zero responses regarding her daughter's whereabouts or well-being. There was a, a memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues tracking down the attenders, take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate his potential suspects. On January the 7th, 1973, Kemper was now living with his mother again. When he drove around the Cabrillo College campus, before picking up 18-year-old student Cynthia Shaw, he took her to a secluded wooded area before shooting her dead. He placed the body in the boot of his car before driving to his mother's home and hiding the corpse in a closet until the next morning. Once his mum left for work, Edmund had sex with the body before removing the bullet to prevent identifying the firearm, decapitating the corpse and then dismembering it in the bathtub. Like before, he kept the head, making it give himself oral sex before burying it in the garden, specifically with the head looking up, facing his mother's bedroom as a joke, claiming that she always wanted people to look up to her. Edmund threw the rest of the remains off a cliff, most of which were discovered, but her head and right hand were never found. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there? Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men. On February the 5th, 1973, Edmund got into yet another heated argument with his mother before storming out of the house in search of more victims. However, due to the disappearances in the area, students were advised to only accept rides from cars which had university stickers on them. Unfortunately, this advice wouldn't do anyone any good as Edmund took this into consideration and purchased such a sticker, as his mother worked at the University of California in Santa Cruz. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what, the, what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear. You know, but they'd be telling me what all about this guy and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. On this particular day, Edmund found 23-year-old Rosalind Thorpe and 20-year-old Alice Liu. Thorpe willingly got into the car and reassured Alice that it was safe to enter. But not long after, Kemper shot them both dead and wrapped their bodies in blankets. He brought them back to his mother's house where he cut their heads off inside the car and carried the rest of the bodies into the house to have sex with them. He dismembered the corpses, removed the bullets and disposed of the remains the next day. Some of these were found just a week later, others not for another month. It's getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility, severing a human head, two of them, at night in front of my mother's residence, with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open, 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on, all they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it, it was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it. 
walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me as they went by. Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent. The head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy. You know, the head is where everything is at. The brain, eyes, mouth. That's the person. I remember being told as a kid, you cut off the head and the body dies. The body is nothing after the head is cut off. But that's not quite true. There's a lot left in the girl's body without the head. During this time, Edmund met a student on a beach and they actually became engaged in March of 1973. However, the wedding never took place. Due to later events, her parents requested her name to never be revealed to the public and her identity remains a mystery. By the time I'm reaching uh, puberty, I'm approaching puberty and I'm starting to sense myself and I've already been accosted by a girlfriend, not sexually, physically, but emotionally. She's trying to, you know, she was a little ahead of me. Uh, we're the same age, but she was uh, pretty aggressive and a beautiful young girl uh, but I wasn't ready for that kind of relationship and I was scared by it she kind of cowed me into backing away from the relationship altogether because she wanted to get physical she wanted to kiss and to neck and to smooch and to imitate what she saw in older kids and that kind of terrified me because I didn't understand the feelings inside and for two months I hadn't killed and I said it's not going to happen to any more girls it's got to stay between me and my mother and it's got to I can't get away from her. We're still fighting. She's still belittling me. She's still, I'm like a puppet on a string, and I entertain her. She knows all my buttons, and I dance like a puppet with that pain. And it had even gotten physical to where I had physically grabbed her and thrown her onto her bed, trying to emphasize a point that she's threatening to kill her. So here I pick up these two young ladies in Berkeley on Ashby Avenue. One has flowers in her hand. Petite little dolls. They're in granny dresses and they're hitchhiking. A couple of real experts. I want to see how together I am, if I can resist this temptation. You going to Walnut Creek? Great. And they get in my car. They want to go one way. I know they need to go the other. If they go the way they're insisting on, we're headed right back out to where the first two co-eds were murdered. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all I gotta do is relax and they'll take me to their death. I've got the gun in the car. The same one I've been doing it with. I insisted, as gently as I could, I took them where they needed to go, to their college. Hey, 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 a lot. That was one week before I murdered my mother. I said, she's gotta die and I've gotta die or girls like that are going to die. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. On April the 20th, 1973, Good Friday, Edmund's 52-year-old mother returned home from a party which woke up her son. She began reading a book in bed when Edmund entered her room. Clarnell noticed his appearance and said, Oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Shit. I looked at her, I said, no. I said, good night. <laughs> and I knew I was going to kill her, you know? And I'm so cold, it's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. It hurts. Because I'm not a lizard, I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina. See? came out of my mother and in a rage I went right back in for seven years she said I haven't had sex with a man because of you my murderous son is one of our arguments I cut off her head and I, and I humiliated her corpse Edmund then waited for her to fall asleep before returning to her room where he bludgeoned his own mother with a claw hammer before slitting her throat with a knife. He then removed her head and made it give him oral sex before he put it on a shelf and screamed at it for an entire hour and then used it as a dartboard, completely smashing her face in. 
He continued to cut out her tongue and larynx and shoved them down the garbage disposal. However, it couldn't break down the vocal cords and spat them back out into the sink, which actually amused Edmund. It seemed appropriate as much as she'd bitched and screamed and yelled at me over so many years. I still loved my mother and it's hard for somebody to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. Kemper hid his mother's corpse in a closet before going to a bar for some drinks. Once back home, he invited her best friend Sarah Hallett over to have dinner and to watch a movie together. She agreed, but once there, Edmund strangled her to death. This was all to create an illusion that his mother and her friend had gone away together for a spontaneous vacation. He then put her corpse in the same closet as well, cleared away any mess, and then left a note for the police to find. Approximately 5.15am, no need for her to suffer anymore at the hands of this horrible murderous butcher. It was quick, asleep, the way I wanted it. Not sloppy and incomplete, gents, just a lack of time. I got things to do. A six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, I wish I had. Edmund then fled the scene and drove all the way to Pueblo, Colorado without stopping, requiring several caffeine pills in order to stay awake for this journey, which was over 1,000 miles. Inside his car, he had three guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, believing that he was going to be targeted for a massive manhunt. However, once arriving in Pueblo, he didn't hear anything on the news about the murders, so he simply called the police and turned himself in. However, they didn't take the call seriously. As explained, Kemper was friends with most of the police force, and they didn't believe that he was capable of murder, thinking that he was just pulling a prank on them. Hours passed before Kemper rang them again and asked to talk to an officer that he knew personally. He then confessed once again and waited for them to arrive to arrest him, which is when he confessed to all of the other murders as well. The original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. It was just a pure waste of time. Emotionally, I couldn't handle it much longer. Toward the end there, I started feeling the folly of the whole damn thing and at the point of near exhaustion, near collapse, I just said to hell with it and called it all off. Why did you wind up giving yourself up? It had to stop. It had to stop. Uh, once my mother was dead, there's almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then, when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I just used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those old concrete parking berms, and I'd just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I could still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom, and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier, when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones. They would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Didn't Kemper stop himself uh, toward the end of his career? Kemper says he did. He says he could have gone on. He said he had fantasies of killing uh, uh, dozens more people of leaving a trail of bodies across the country and at one point he just got on the telephone and turned himself in. He said it was time for the killing to stop. In his case he said uh, publicly that it was his mother that he was killing all along and when he killed his mother uh, that was the end. It's a very deep psychological observation from himself that uh, may be very accurate. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess but it's not it's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. 
I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. On May the 7th, 1973, Kemper was indicted on eight counts of first-degree murder. But because he confessed in such great detail, he was advised to claim insanity. Edmund, however, attempted to commit suicide twice whilst in custody, but failed, and his trial went ahead on October the 23rd, 1973. And the pen is mightier than the sword. I turned the pen into a sword and, and cut myself. Both times I attempted suicide, I did it with a pen or parts of a pen. And I thought that was kind of uh, interesting, but uh, the media never picked up on that. Three psychiatrists found him to be completely sane, but admitted that he used to be psychotic. He was interviewed explicitly, even under truth serum, and was concluded that he actually enjoyed the infamy of being known as a murderer. It was also believed for a while that he performed cannibalism, but this was later discarded. Kemper showed signs of malice aforethought and premeditated his actions before and after each killing, ruling out the possibility of him being insane. On November the 1st, Kemper spoke up and claimed that he killed people because he wanted them for himself, as if they were his own possessions. He insisted that he was insane and that his actions would have only been committed by someone without sound mind, claiming that he blacked out when these actions occurred. On November the 8th, a week later, after five hours deliberation, Edmund Kemper was found to be sane and guilty of all counts of murder. He actually specifically asked to be given the death penalty, wanting death by torture. And that was when I made the statement that I should be hung upside down on the bars and beaten daily, right, for what I did. Because under the influence of those drugs, I was seeing what I did through other people's eyes. Not through mine, I won't say through other specific person's eyes, but as someone else would view it. Pure horror. Someone that had nothing to do with violence in their life um, would see it. I was completely unprotected, and that was an awful experience. However, the Supreme Court of California instead gave him seven years to life for each count, and was sentenced to the California Medical Facility. He was in the same facility as other killers such as Charles Manson and Herbert Mullen, who Kemper completely despised, calling him a cold-blooded killer who would murder everybody he saw for no good reason. And what it is, he's a little wimpy guy that hates big guys because he always feels intimidated by them. Mullen was only 5 foot 9, so Kemper towered over him and would often manipulate and intimidate him. During interviews, his size would often make the interviewers very nervous, leading to them hitting a secret panic button. But sometimes, officers wouldn't respond for up to half an hour. Kemper was first eligible for parole in 1979, but he was denied as well as every year until 1982. He was denied once again in 88 and said, Society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He was denied parole again in 1991, 1994, he didn't want a hearing in 97 or 2002, and was denied again in 2007. We don't care how much of a model prisoner he is because of the enormity of his crimes. Yet, yeah, Kemper is described as a model prisoner, often being in charge of scheduling other inmates' appointments, and he would often craft together ceramic cups. He would read audiobooks for the blind and actually spent over 5,000 hours doing so. However, in 2015, he was 67 years old and was no longer able to perform these duties as he had a stroke and was now considered medically disabled. He didn't receive a rules violation until 2016, 43 years after being sent to prison, and this was just for refusing to provide a urine sample. Kemper was described as one of the most intelligent serial killers and provided rare insight for a violent criminal. He claimed that he contributed to so many interviews in hopes that he would save others like him from killing more innocent people. There's somebody out there that is watching this and hasn't done that, hasn't killed people and wants to, and rages inside and struggles with that feeling, or is so sure they have it under control. They need to talk to somebody about it. Trust somebody enough to sit down and talk about something that isn't a crime. Thinking that way isn't a crime. Doing it isn't just a crime, it's a horrible thing. It doesn't know when to quit, and it can't be stopped easily once it starts. 
Kemper waived his right to a parole hearing in 2012 and was denied parole again in 2017. He won't be eligible again until the year 2024 and he currently remains at the California Medical Facility to this day at the age of 73. Kemper however claimed that he didn't actually want to be released anymore and that he was simply enjoying his peaceful life inside and planned to spend the rest of his life there. Was Edmund Kemper unaware of his actions? Or were the poor conditions of his upbringing the true trigger of his growing rage and hatred towards women? Could this entire story have been completely prevented to begin with? Edmund Kemper continues to live on with the memories of his horrific actions, while the rest of us simply remain seeking answers.